Lots of laughing and carry on. That's always good. Good to see you with us. Take your hymn books. Turn to number 32. Number 32. Stand with me if you can. We'll sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. <clears throat> Crown Him with Many Crowns The Lamb upon His throne Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own Awake my soul and sing Of him who died for thee And hail him as thy matchless king Through all eternity Crown him the Lord of love Behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his wandering eye at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through him give from his eternal throne. To thee be endless praise, for thou for us hast died. Be thou, O Lord, through endless days, adored and magnified. Well, amen. It's good to be in God's house today. I missed y'all. We had between Christmas and then other incidents with our water system, and then us being gone for a week and instance with the water system. <laughs> with everything that's been going on, it's just like we've been scattered cheap. And man, it's good to be back and here in this second Sunday in 2023. It's good to have our visitors with us today. Appreciate y'all all being here with us today. Just good to be in God's house today. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm out of sorts today. I've just not, we've been, so if I forget your name or forget my name or, or something important today, please overlook and forgive me. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer today. Uh, brother Scott, how about if you'd lead us for the throne of grace this morning, brother? Amen. You may be seated. Got a couple of announcements this morning. First of all, I want to thank those that made it to Sunday school. We had a good crowd. I think I counted 17 in the adult class this morning. I think y'all had five in the children's class. So praise the Lord for a good, a good start in Sunday school. But I want to encourage you and uh, urge you to uh, make use of Sunday school time. We'll get our day started around here and get a little bit more relaxed back there. You can drink coffee in there and all that kind of stuff. And I was going to say we laugh a little bit more back there, but we may laugh more out here. I don't know. We need to take a tally on that. But uh, anyway, it's a good time in Sunday school, and I've uh, been a lot of focus lately on eternal life and eternity. Uh, well, kind of the same message on the inside and outside. Uh, Lord must be sending that message. Wouldn't you think so and agree with that? But nonetheless, I invite you to come to Sunday school if you would. If you're not used to participating in Sunday school, uh, I want to mention also the evening service night, 6 o'clock. Tuesday morning, ladies' Bible study here at the church at 1030. That's not member, membership-driven or required or anything like that. If you're a lady and love the Lord, love fellowship with other ladies, uh, be here at 1030 Tuesday mornings. And I will be kind of kicking it back off since we've been off for a few weeks with Christmas and traveling to different things. And, and I also am looking forward to the ladies getting back and Hold on just a second. Knock my ear off. Brings to mind, would Mike Tyson have kept chewing that up or would he spit it back out? I don't know. Uh, I don't know where that came from. 
<laughs> well, I really do. There's vast space in my noggin. But anyhow, Tuesday morning, Kids for Truth, Wednesday night, the van started back running last week. And uh, looking forward to Wednesday night, midweek service, Kids for Truth at 6, 7 o'clock in back. And then, of course, our regular midweek prayer, prayer and Bible study uh, time out here on, in the sanctuary. Ladies meeting, the monthly ladies meeting, meeting will be this Saturday morning at 1030. So ladies, there again, it's got not, not got to do with being a member or anything like that. If you're a lady, love the Lord, good time of fellowship and all that uh, ladies meet, 1030 Saturday morning. Um, y'all do remember to pray for our missionaries. Uh, our missionary of the week this week, is, there's Joshua missionaries, I should say, Joshua and Melissa Booth. And tell me their little boy's name, Logan. Logan, Logan. And they're in England, so remember them and pray for them and all our missionaries that we support here at Hardison Baptist Church. I've got a card here. Y'all pray for those. There's a lot of different ones on the prayer list. Praise the Lord. Brother Fred's mother's doing some better. And uh, not I do it yet, but praise the Lord for her improvement. A lot of other needs, different ones. Brother David, remember him. It's Brandy. Uh, several different ones, a lot of different ones on the prayer list, y'all, but need to be a praying people. Uh, got a card here that says, thank you. And uh, it says, may the Lord reward you for your kindness. It says, we give thanks to God always for all of you can constantly mention you in our prayers. It says, Ernie and I want to say how grateful we are for all who gave and worked on our new porch and wheelchair ramp. We desperately needed a new porch after the fire damaged our other one. Um, also, even right now, I'm not necessarily needing the wheelchair ramp. I do know I'll be needing it again in the future due to health issues. We can't thank our Lord Jesus Christ enough for the love and support of our church family. Our porch and ramp is absolutely beautiful. What a wonderful gift it is. Again, thank you all. Love, Ernie and Denise Kale. So I appreciate that. Appreciate your labor, those that have participated with that, and those that have given. If you'd still like to give to that, just ear note a, a check to wheelchair pro or a porch project. Or, you know, if you give them, uh, anyway, you could do that if you wanted to contribute to that cost of that. Well, I guess that's all as far as some announcements and all, brothers. Come on up and leave us another good song. Okay. All right. 433. I hope this is your conversation. It's more about Jesus. 433. Jesus would I know more of his grace to others show more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me more more about Jesus more more about Jesus more of his saving love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More died for me more about Jesus on his throne riches and glory all his own more of his kingdom sure increase more of his coming prince of peace more more about Jesus more for me how many of you that was the first time you heard that song a few of you well you didn't sing like that was the first that's or actually you did sing like it was the first time but... <laughs> all right well this one should be more familiar 507 it's like a, i know it's like a mystery you're like what's 507 let me flip over there and see 
Well, once you find your spot at 507, stand with me if you can. We'll sing all three verses of In the Garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and He walks with me and He talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other shall ever Amen. You may be seated. to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely he did something that no other friend could do no one ever cared for me like Jesus there's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was filled with sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me And he led me in the way I ought to go No one ever cared for me like Jesus There's no other friend so kind as he No one else could take the sin and darkness from me Oh, how much he cared for me. 
Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his word of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. And just for a few minutes, I'd like to, I just, he is the only one who cares. And I'm hoping my New Year's resolution is this year that, that this country and our community and our church will get closer to God and we will bring God back to this country. Amen. Thank you, Brother Charles. Amen. Again, sure it's good to see everybody this morning. Turn your Bibles to the book of the Revelation. Children, or at least young people and the teachers. To children's church, junior church. Revelation 3, if you would. Revelation chapter 3. I don't know what is going on with me this morning. I'm so out of sorts. Uh, I guess I feel like I've got jet lag or something. I don't know. You Just the business and everything through the holidays. And I've got a lot on my mind, a lot on my heart. And I uh, went up. The school was excellent last week. The class I took on expository preaching, really good. A lot of information. That may be part of my problem it's so much information in such a short time, and I'm also praying about our vision for this year, and I'm not, I, I told you I would come back and reveal that to you. That's been a week in North Carolina. I, surely I'd have peace with it and be ready to reveal it and all, but at once I got up and realized, I, thought, I, I, said, I, I said, self? And self said, what? <laughs> and, I, and I said, why did you tell them that, knowing you're going to be up here and busy all day long, all week long? And so I, I'm not ready to reveal it. I have been working on it, and it's really neat. I was in a, it's a really nice little Christian bookstore in King, North Carolina. They have a branch in Mount Airy right down the road as well called Gullions. But uh, they're, on, they're a, a Christian bookstore, and only Bibles they sell are King James Bibles. And all their stuff is uh, pretty fundamentally sound and everything. I'll just really nice store. But, store. but I found a, a good book on the subject that I'm wanting to have as a vision and a mission this year from Warren Wiersbe, one of my favorite writers. I've been, I thought, man, how about that? Run across a book from one of my favorite writers on the subject that I'm uh, really wanting to lead the church and, and, and uh, change. But I, I will tell you, uh, my, my heart, I, I'll just say this. I said a little bit about it the other day, but the subject of the theme, and I don't, I don't have verses and everything right now and posters and, and uh flags and banners and all that quite yet and all, but the subject of worship. And uh, I, I just feel like in our churches, now I'm, when I say worship, I'm not talking about just the song service. I'm talking about in our lives. So many things we do out of routine, and we come to church, and we do come out of routine a lot of times. We go to Sunday school out of routine. We do this out of We preach out of routine. A lot of times things we do rather than having a heart to worship the Lord in a pureness and just thinking on Him and all He's done for us and living our lives as a life of worship. And I think we, as Hardison Baptist Church, and if 
honest, if everybody be honest with it, with us, probably 90% of professing Christians suffer in the area of really worshiping the Lord. But uh, anyway, so I want to, uh, that's as much as I'll say about that until I have more and can present it in fullness. And I'm uh, just trusting the Lord to give some verses and some uh, uh, plan for the year. Uh, with that, not necessarily every week or anything, but a theme to kind of follow along and go with. But while we're there, let's go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter, you're already there, verse 14 through 22. I appreciate those of you that kind of held things together through the week. We're bear with us with the water problems. They're beyond our control. We had the all the fruit, frozen pipes in the attic, and we made a lot of effort for that not to happen, but it happened anyway. And uh, we got all that taken care of the week before last, and uh, enough to get us by. We're probably going to replumb that whole building uh, in, in the next few months to get rid of the possibility of that happening again with that old CPVC pipe. Uh, I feel like I need to go down and repent after saying CPVC from the pulpit. I hate that stuff. <laughs> It was, it was pretty good stuff 30 years ago and when it's three years old, but when it's 30 years old, it's not good anymore. But anyway, we're going to do that. But then we had the problems with the well. They came out and pulled the well and replaced the pump. And then after that, uh, due to the cast iron casing that's in, had more problems with that. And they came back out. And I appreciate those of you that worked alongside and helped and made do. I appreciate just everybody that's done everything, kind of held the fort together while we were gone. And I appreciate this, even some of you tried to hide the problems from me while we were gone, so I wouldn't be burdened with that from up there. But the little birdie let it out, <laughs> and then I kind of I kind of heard, and somebody said, how did you know about that? And, and all, but I, anyway, I appreciate all of you being in your place and doing what you do and, and uh, just making things work and get by. We have water today, hopefully we'll have it tonight and Wednesday night. Revelation 3, starting at verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold, I would thou wert hot or cold. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and am increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. Well, it's quite a contrast, isn't it, from what man thinks we are to what we really are in God's sight. And even as Christians, sometimes we think our walk is up there and a little holier than thou attitude. And sometimes we're so, we might be near him with our mouth, but so far from him with our hearts, hadn't we? Verse 18 says, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, and thou mayest be, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mightest see. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set with my father on his throne, in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Have you ever had an appointment with the eye doctor? We all have. I, as I say that, I look around and there's, uh, one that's not here today, but has recently had two eye surgeries. One had eye surgery, one's having some eye issues, and several has had eye issues lately. But I'm not talking about the physical eye this morning. Uh, but I mean, the eye doctor, I say that, the eye doctor, the optician. Like other doctors, I don't like to go to them. I don't like they put my chin on that thing. And they say, sit there, and I don't care how many years old I get to be, how many times they warn me that that puff of air is going to blow my air. Every time they 
hit that button, that thing will right in my eye. I jumped my head back and scared me every single time. How about you? But going to the doctor, we don't like to go. We only go when it's necessary. I generally wait till I about can't see my Bible up here anymore. And I say, you know, it's time to go to the eye doctor again. I go to the optician. Uh, we have to trust their professional judgment. We go to them. We go. We don't go in and say, yes, doc, my eyes have decreased 3%. I need you to change that. To, and I can't rattle off no fancy numbers. But we don't go and do that. We look at them and they, we just answer their questions, this one or that one, this one or that one. <laughs> and we say this one or we say that one. And they write a prescription and we order a set of glasses. We have to trust their judgment. Spiritually speaking, we need to go to the optician probably much more than we do. I want to preach to you this morning a message I've entitled an appointment with the optician. An appointment with the optician. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning. God, I pray that you'd help us to see our hearts. God, as you see them. Lord, if there's one here today that's lost, that's never trusted you, that's never been genuinely born again, God, I pray that you'd reveal to them their lost condition. And Lord, for those of us today that are saved, that are, have placed our trust and our faith in you for salvation, God, I pray that we'd examine our hearts. Lord, not only that we'd examine them during the preaching and during the invitation time, but Lord, daily in our lives, Lord, that we'd make it a, an appointment, a regular appointment with you, Lord. And God, uh, God, that we'd always have an invitation that you'd search our hearts and show us our wicked ways, Lord. God, we'd be receptive to the change that you prescribe in our lives. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to preach truth this morning. Lord, we sure thank you for our visitors today. I pray that you'd be with all those that couldn't be here. I thank little Christopher, Lord. I pray you'd touch him, help him to feel better this morning. Lord, and all the others on a prayer list. Right here and now, I pray that you'd help me to preach in your power. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of the Revelation, obviously the last book of the Bible, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your Bible at the front heading might say the revelation of John. It's not John's revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ to John, and it's for the church. Got a lot of prophecy in it, and uh, boy, some, uh, just reading through it, first glance, some things that come across not in our normal language and everyday thinking, those trumpets, woes, seals, and all the things going on, and and I owe it to you to preach through the Revelation. It's uh, uh, kind of a deep book in a sense, but the good thing is, is the judgments and all are, are really to those that have not trusted Christ. And for the church, we'll be called out and the rapture of the church in Revelation 3. We'll be called out and to come up hither in 4.1. Uh, we won't be here. The church is not mentioned again until 19 and 20, chapter 19 and 20, when we come back for the uh, millennial kingdom. But it is going to be a tough time that's described in those judgments that take place on earth and what we call the tribulation and the great tribulation. But it reveals events, this book of the Revelation reveals events of the time to come and some things that's gone by. We can look back and see the church age embedded in the first three. It, it uh, calls out those seven churches that were literal physical churches there that had these problems and high points that the Lord addresses in the first three, two chapters, I mean chapters two and three. And then we can look through and see the church age, not only as uh, the seven churches that were there, but we can also see seven time frames of history leading up to now. And, and don't be too uh, overzealous to apply those things, but we can, I believe, see some, some time looking backwards, that they certainly didn't see then. But this Laodicea, this last church that's addressed here, and if we look at it, I believe that uh, Philadelphia is the last church that the good things are spoken of, and then there's a lot of correction and rebuke to Laodicea in church, that I, the things I just read. I believe we're somewhere in the middle of that. However, as we look around the grand scope of the earth, I don't believe we're all, that's why I say don't be so overzealous to apply this to prophecy because everywhere on earth it's in the same 
place in church. There's places where there's great revivals going on, around the, on, on and around the world. Uh, as we had the Great Awakening 100 years ago or so in America and this part of the world, there's things like that going on in, in the Philippines and some places in South America that were, they've not got to the place where America's at in church where we've kind of done been in a church time for so long, we've gotten lackadaisical with it and kind of just accepted it and, and we've kind of, uh, uh, the phrase, you hear the phrase a lot of times, a post-Christian America. But there's third world countries in the world that's just now getting good revival, just now getting, uh, I mean, more folks getting saved and, and they're not sitting back just, uh, you know, uh, hit and miss every now and then Christians like Americans are. Uh, man, they're on fire for God. So it'd be hard to say that I believe America's hit like the Laodicean church age. But boy, I believe there's some places in the world where it's Philadelphia. So it's not for me to outline those times. I just know that the Bible teaches us to be ready because he's coming any day. He's coming soon. And that apply to the third world country or us. I guess if they're third world country, are we second world or first world? I think we were first world, but I think we've headed to second and we're going to second, and we're going back to third pretty quick. What do you think? But let's look at some things here. There's a charge there in verse 14. Uh, it says that to the layout of sins, uh, well, in, in verse 15, rather, it says, Thou art neither hot nor cold. I know thy works, thou art neither hot nor cold. And, and he goes on and says, uh, it's because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. And hot or cold, if they're, if they're cold, they know there's a problem. They're indifferent with God. But if they're, uh, if they're hot, they're probably fixing, I mean, uh, a person is hot, is probably fixing physical. But the problem, they're, they're lukewarm. Uh, they're neither one. They're lackadaisical. They're just accepting the way things are, just kind of half-hearted serving God, just a little spare change type Christian, just a little, uh, I'll, I'll go if it's convenient and nothing else going on. I'll, I'll serve. Serve God, boy. If a man, if a lost person just falls down in front of me, I might give him a gospel track or something. We just kind of lack days ago. We're, we're very lukewarm as Christians in America nowadays. And I'm not preach, preaching to America. I'm preaching to Hardison Baptist Church. And as your pastor, can I say that I believe collectively we're all pretty. We're far too lukewarm. The Lord rather us be hot or cold. Well, if we're caught, if we're cold, man, we can really be revived. We can be challenged by the Spirit of God, and we can warm up where we ought to be. If we're we're on fire, we're doing great things, and and all. But anyway, it says they're they're lukewarm, they're neither hot nor cold. And there's a that was the charge there. There's a problem with the condition you're in, and there's a claim. Look down at verse 17. It says, "Thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing." What a dangerous place for a church or a Christian to feel like we're at. That's an arrived attitude. I've arrived. I don't need anything. I, I know this. I know that. I've done this in the past. I used to do this. And we, I, I, oh, I know about that. You don't, preacher, you don't need to preach about, about that. I know about that. I've done, preacher, you don't need to preach about that. I've done that before. And we're just, we're there. Boy, we got everything, padded pews, air conditioning, running water sometimes. <laughs> because I say this, I have need of nothing. Most dangerous place a Christian can be. And the counsel, well, God's always given counsel, hadn't he? If you read Psalm 1, he gives us instruction about counsel. Not from the ungodly, but from the godly we should seek counsel. But we have counsel. In verse 18, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment thou mayest be clothed in a shame, and uh, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. You know, I preach for three or four messages on the judgment seat of Christ and, and we know there's things that are the word of God the, for the judgment for the Christians after the rapture of the church that will go before him and those things will be tried. Our works will be tried. By the fire of the word of God and those things that were wrong motives and wrong attitudes, 
uh, man, they're wood, hay, and stubble, and they'll, they'll, they'll flame away right before our eyes, but those things that are solid will be rewarded. Those things that was done out of a right motive for God, out of a sincere heart for the Lord, they'll be, they'll be honored. They'll be, uh, you know, we'll receive rewards that, will in, in, that really are, have to do with worship. They will worship the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven, cast those crowns before him. But he says, I counsel thee. To buy me gold, trying to fire. In other words, do it with the right motive. Do it for Jesus Christ. Do it out of a pure heart. So there's a counsel. Counsel, rather, not cancel. And there's a charge. In verse 17, it says, Thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And I'm concerned this morning more with the blindness. Thou art blind. There's a challenge. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy me gold, try to fire. Go down toward the end, he says, and he says, Thy necks do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So we have a challenge there. And then the cure ultimately is that thou mayest see. So we have a problem there's some problems pointed out in our life but then there's a prescription given boy we just trust the lord walk the lord thine eyes with eyes i will talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but the curious that we might see that we'd see right and see like we ought to see see things as they really are you know as christians we're so often we're guilty of just accepting the status quo now whether you are frequent to the house of God one time a month or whether you're here every time the doors are open. We get used to a place where we're at and we get satisfied there and we tell ourselves, well, I'm doing my part. Brother Brian and, and Brother Brian and, and uh, Sunday school's going to get the testimony before he got saved. His hope was in the fact back when he was a younger teenager, not that you're an older teenager now, but back when he was an old, younger teenager, that he, they thought because he goes to church one time, one service a week, that he had it covered. It was good. It was good. He was going to heaven. He had it covered. And then one day the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of his heart and he realized, don't matter if you go every, I mean, I mean I'm adding to that a little bit, but the fact is, don't matter if you go every time, if you go when the doors ain't open, stand outside the door, that won't get you to heaven. It's only trust in Jesus Christ and the finished work of Calvary that'll get you to heaven. But I'm just trying to say that we get, we're not honest with ourselves and with others and our Savior Many times we say we're just doing just fine in our walk with the Lord. Uh, we, you ask the person, say, how are you doing? They say, just fine, just fine. And really, when our hearts are tore up, we're, we're nowhere in a backslidden place, we got every kind of temptation knocking on our heart's door and we're walking just in, in terrible and uh well man just we're having to fake it come to church like everything's great and fine and somebody say how you doing we say fine and the greater problem is we tell ourselves we're doing fine and then the biggest danger is we tell the lord we're doing fine like he doesn't know what a grave danger in that pastors do the same things I try not to preach. I'm on an elevated pull, pull platform because of the model of the platform. I, I think back to the book of Nehemiah and Ezra when they built a platform of wood and it was a raised platform and had to do with uh, looking upward toward the truth of God, but also they didn't have PA systems. They had to be above them where the people hear them. But I try not to preach down to the congregation because, well, this will, man, the ground's level at the foot of the cross, ain't it? Man, I, I try to tell you right regular. when I'm preaching to y'all, I'm preaching to me first. God didn't preach to me in preparation. Then I have to stand up here and preach it to me. And I hope y'all get it too, because it's a preaching to me too. But with pastors do the same things. And I hear preachers sometimes in, in a conversation, and somebody say, hey man, how's things going over at Third Baptist, wherever they pastor at? And, and, uh, and they'll say, something, oh man, it's great, it's great, boy, everything's doing good and all that. And man, that's the conversation I had with them. They just went through a fire, about, like, about to go slap out down there. Does that act like everything's hunky-dory and great? Why are we this way? Boy, we need... The eyes, we need that ointment. We need an appointment with the optician. That's why. 
In verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. That church, they're the Laodiceans, the, their thought toward God. Jesus, these are Jesus' words. And he's saying, you said, so he must have read their hearts, hadn't he? And knew their hearts. They, boy, they uh, must have been like the average church in America. Now everything's comfortable, good. The light bill's paid. Uh, and we got on fairly nice clothes, I reckon, if that's important to you. We got a, we drove a somewhat of a decent auto building a church. And boy, we're just doing good, aren't we? Everything's great. We got, got a few folks in here today. Must be doing great, hadn't we? But God on the other side has probably got a different idea and a different thought that, oh, we're doing just a little bit of what we need to do. Now, if you don't think, if you think I'm preaching down to you, you ought to, as the pastor, make that statement, knowing that old Dr. Lee Robinson said success rises and falls on leadership. By the way, that's a biblical principle too. But verse 17, thou art blind. Number one, let's talk about the obstruction. Why are we blind in church in America? Why was the layout of sin Church, why were they blind? Why do they think they had it made and everything's hunky dory and great and grand? But, on, but in truth, it's not. In truth, it's not. Number one, can I say, because sin obstructs, or not number one, letter A, if you would, a point under the first point, the obstruction, thou art blind. Sin obstructs vision. Sin obstructs vision. Luke 16, 15, and he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men, but, know, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Man, we're so messed up with sin in our nation anymore, we don't know what sin is anymore as a nation. The problem is that's crept into our churches. I would challenge you, to go back to Wednesday night to uh, go to on Facebook or YouTube, go to King, I mean Calvary Baptist Church, King, North Carolina, and watch the message. My son preached Wednesday night on the problems with genderization, the loss of gender, the gender issues, LGBT, and all that that's going on in this nation today. I would challenge you to go back and listen to that message. Tons of information. He preached it to his youth group. About three months ago, and Pastor Borhill had him preach it to the church because the amount of information he gives in that message uh, is not so much a great Bible message, a lot of Bible truth in it and all, but it's really eye-opening to what's going on in our nation and how that's being force-fed down our throats. Every TV show, every commercial has got those on there, and it's forced down our throats, and we accept it, and everybody just thinks it's fine. We'll leave them alone. No, it's the downfall of our nation. It's an abomination to God. I did not say it's the only sin that's abomination to God, but we accept it more and more and more that sin blinds. That's just, I'm just using that as an illustration that because the sin blinds. And not only that sin, but many other sins, a lot of times when we ourselves get involved with sin, we have a temptation of it, and we fall into the sin, we bite the uh, apple, so to speak, we, we bite into the temptation, we start justifying ourselves. Well, it's really not that bad. Well, it's just bad if they do it a certain way, or if I do it this way, or if I do it here or there, whatever, we just, we just make out like that sin's not a problem anymore because we're involved with it. Or if our children are, are involved with the sin, or our parents are involved with sin, we kind of make out like it's just okay. Oh, well, I don't really see anything wrong with it now that my children's doing it. it must not, all those other children must not really be that bad either, because my children do it too. It's probably not that bad. My friends, let me tell you something. If God said it's wrong, it's wrong. Sin obstructs vision. Self-obstructs vision. I already kind of taught that a little bit. We, boy, we're never honest with ourselves. We're always things are a little bit better than they are, or worse than ourselves. Rarely do we uh, uh, access our lives and our spiritual walk and completely honest with you. Can I just say this? I don't know about you, but I'll be honest with you. I need to read my Bible a whole lot more. I need to pray a whole lot more. Man, I need to be more faithful to what God's called me to do. do. You say, preacher, you're not very much. Preacher, I'm praying you good to not do no more than you're doing. Well, I'm just being honest with myself. It don't matter if I prayed two hours this morning, read my Bible four hours. I ain't doing what I ought to do. 
We ought to just have a desire to do more for Jesus, more for him. Self, though, we, we seem, seem to self-justify ourselves. Let me tell you something else. Satan, not only sin obstructs vision, self obstructs vision, but Satan obstructs vision. Boy, don't you know in every opportunity he had through one of his imps or angels or devils or whatever to tell these members that lay out of sin First Baptist Church to tell them, hey, y'all are just doing great. Don't No, don't take your Bible to church. No, you don't need that thing. No, don't read your Bible tonight. You won't need that. No, why do you want to pray? You can go watch seven episodes of that latest being show you've been watching on Netflix. Don't pray tonight. You don't need to do that. The devil will tell you that stuff. And we'll listen. Now, he doesn't come in an audible voice and tell us that. He just presents everything in the world to distract us. And boy, we go right with the distraction, don't we? Satan obstructs vision. But here's a verse for that, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the mind of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, that's addressing lost folks and their condition being blinded by Satan in this world. But let me tell you what, though. Don't think for a minute that being saved, that we're not subject to the same, that he doesn't do everything he can to throw sand in our eyes. Society obstructs vision. John 14, 30, after, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing to do with me. And boy, this world, the Bible, the New Testament calls this present evil world we're living in. And I, I've kind of already brought that out, but things that are accepted in society and push forward. You know, I, I was talking about this after church a few weeks ago with somebody down, we was down here talking, and I don't remember who it was in the context of everything, but there used to be a saying that, that there's a, whatever the spiritual attitude of Europe and England and that area, whatever the spiritual attitude is, and can I say they wickedly have left the word of God over there, the great big churches and cathedrals and all that used to be thousands of people. You go there, if they're open and all, if they're doing anything that has to do with church and Jesus Christ, there might be seven or eight literally. So talk to people that go there, that go over there. That literally, be churches, there used to be thousands, there'd be seven or eight people come to their Sunday morning service. But it used to be a saying that whatever happens in England, 10 years later, catches in California, and then 10 years later, gets we take that. So there, in other words, England's a generation ahead of us in sin, our generation ahead of California. California's a generation ahead of us, but guess what? I can click on this and in contact with the whole world all the time. So that generation is gone from a generation, if there's any gap at all, it's just hours or minutes or maybe a day or a week or two. Maybe in some subjects as far as being accepted, things being accepted in society, maybe a year or two. But those 20 years difference between us and England and sin, that's gone. Society obstructs vision terribly. Man, I hadn't said anything about it because I hadn't been on the school bus in two and a half months now. But just to hear those precious little children talk would break your heart. What they're subject to, what they hear. I've had to write up 4K children. I'm not even going to describe the cuss word they would use, but one I probably never heard till I was in the seventh grade. But I've had to write up and have them removed from the bus for discipline purposes to, you know, hopefully to teach them better for saying words that would blow your mind. Four-year-olds. It's the society we live in. And can I say Crawford County is a pretty conservative little country, country place? The obstructs and thou art blind church. How's your eyesight day? Are you blinded by those things? Or are you seeing like we ought to see? Let's go on a little bit. Let's notice there is a doctor. His name's Dr. Jesus. No better doctor. We knows what ails us. He's got the prescription. 
He made the medicine. Can I say it that way? In chapter 18, it says, I counsel thee to buy the, me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, thou mayest be clothed, I'm ashamed, thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes, eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And goes on, verse 21, to him that overcometh, I grant sit with him. And, but you see there, can I just say that, that I of Jesus Christ is no less than the I of the I am of the Old Testament? God Almighty, God the Son, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit of God, the deity of Jesus Christ, where the Word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. Let me just say today as doctor and Dr. Jesus is the, the optician that we need to go to and go to. And that's not a once every six month thing. We need to, friends, we need to go before him every single day. We need to focus as my vision for the church for this year would be that we're ever before him, not just when it's convenient. And that's to all of us, that we're ever before him because we're always looking up to him with our lives. But he knows the need. No matter how much we lie and tell everybody else, tell our own spouses sometimes, oh, everything's fine. Put that little fake, I won't say cheerleader smile, but I told a cheerleader that one time. She didn't think that was so funny. <laughs> he knows the diagnosis. He's given us his word. He's given us a prescription in John 3, 16. Hey, for the lost, if you're here today and lost today, hey, there's hope. Jesus Christ died paid your price, your sin price on Calvary. He's paid your sin debt already. All you got to do is trust him today. But for those of us that are saved, he knows the diagnosis. But all we need to do is look at him, look to him. Say, Lord, what do I need to do? Lord, open my eyes. David talked about it a little bit. He said, search me, see if there be any wicked way in me. And invite the optician, open our eyes that he might look into our souls, I guess you'd say. As that eye doctor look, gets those little instruments, looks all up inside our eyes and all, and, and sees. And he said, well, I see a little of this, and I see a little of that in there. Well, I think about about seven, eight years ago, I went to a doctor in one of Robbins, and he looked in there, and he said, sir, you've got demacular generation starting in your right eye. And he gave me that little, I can't think of what it's called, but that little grid, you know what I'm talking about, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but he gave me that little grid and, and uh, told me how, and of course, you can Google it and print your own self out one, and, and you put that thing in front of your face and cover your eye and look at it, and then cover your eye and look at that thing, and he said, if you get where you start seeing that things move around all, he said, you call me right then. So, man, I started taking them over, I occupied, I vibe, of course, I got the Sam's generic ones, you know, but got me some of them Occuvite vitamins, got all that stuff in a few eyes and went treating on them eyes and all. And, and uh, man, about two or three years later, I, I went to wait too long to go to the eye doctor. And that's a problem. We, we wait too long before we go to the optician, don't we, Dr. Jesus? Wait till things done cause a problem in our life, don't we? But I went back and praise the Lord here about two years ago when I went back to the doctor, and I told him about that and and the uh, doctor looked all in my eyes, looked all around. He kept looking all in there and, and said, I don't know what that doctor saw, but I don't see a thing wrong with your eyes. Well, I, here again, I'm going to say, praise God, Dr. Jesus fixed it. You might say that first doctor was blind. I don't know. He was our doctor. I, give him I got confidence he could see. I just believe whatever's there, the Lord fixed it. Whether it's been through them vitamins or, or just divine touch from heaven, I, I don't question that. It don't matter to me. I just praise him for fixing it. He knows the need. He makes the diagnosis. What's the diagnosis? Well, there's a verse of scripture for whatever's bothering you and troubling you. There's a verse of scripture for it. There's a principle in the word of God, whether it be temptation. Uh, boy, there's no temptation taking you. Such is not common to man, the Bible says. And then to turn it to Jesus. Turn it over to him. I'm going to paraphrase. I can't remember the rest of it. But he'll leave you a way out of that if you'll just go with him, not go with the temptation. And sometimes we're already there. We're already there in the sin. Well, 1 John 1, 9, boy, just confess that thing. Turn it over to Jesus. Say, Lord, forgive me. Give me help with that thing. I repent of it, Lord. I don't want no more. I'm tired of it. Help me with it. Give me strength. I give it to you. But he makes a diagnosis. He can give us the correct lenses. 
and give us the correct lenses for the saved with vision problems. Boy, he'll, he'll fix that. He'll, uh, boy, if we just trust him when we've got things going on in life that aren't right, and maybe not even things that are sin, but things that we don't have any control of that are taking a toll on us. Well, if we just trust us, he knows he'll, he'll fix it. If he won't fix it, he don't promise he'll take us away from everything away from us. Some things he just gives us grace to get through it. Ask the Apostle Paul about that. But it would be interesting when we get to heaven. I, I like to think about that time time we get to heaven. I got a lot of questions for a lot of things. Now, these things we think are important that we want to know about in heaven when we get there probably ain't going to be near as important as we thought they were. When we see him, a lot of these little things we worry about on this side ain't going to matter no more. Matter of fact, there's a place, there's a time coming he's going to wipe all that away anyway in the knowledge of this whole life anyway. But as for right now, if I could see Apostle Paul right now, man, there's a lot of things I like to ask him. Oh, Peter. One thing I want to ask him, what was you fishing with the day before and what was you fishing with that day when you wasn't catching it? No, I'm, I'm joking about that. <laughs> but seriously, there's a lot of things I like to ask him, a lot of questions I've got. Not doubt in the Bible I'm not talking about, but Paul, man, a man that lived his life, wore out his life and body serving the Lord. But then even he wrote over in Romans 7, the things that I knew I ought to be doing was the things I found myself not doing. And the things I knew I ought not be doing well, the very things I found myself doing. But he can give us the correct lenses for the saved with vision problems. He'll get us on the right path. He's given us a, a plan, a place that we can turn to him for forgiveness and repentance of those things as a saved person that our fellowship might be restored and our vision corrected, walking, looking plainly. But then for the lost we well, can cause the blind to see, can't he? Several places in the Bible. Blind, blind Bartimaeus. And a couple of other places in the Bible where folks was blind and, and the Lord came by and fixed them. And there's pictures of in, in us that if, and if you're here today and you've never been born again, that you're spiritually blinded. You, you don't know Christ. There's no relationship there. There's a, a spiritual blindness there. But ultimately, there's a sin that's never been forgiven, and he died for that sin. He, he made a way that, we might, that our eyes might be open, that your eyes might be open. You might uh, know that you have a home in heaven, that your sins are forgiven if you just trust him today. The obstruction, the, the, the optician, Jesus Christ, the eye salve, verse 18, the ointment that he talks about in the end of it, Number three, it says, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that they may see. I think about over in the Old Testament place where it talks about Jesus, a balm and salve is pretty close to the same thing, ain't it? You don't hear those words very much anymore. Ointment, I guess, is kind of a word we still use, but you don't hear much about a balm. Well, there's tiger balm, ain't it? Don't put that in your eye, though. <laughs> but salves, how many of us grew up with big salve? I guess they still sell it. Boy, spend night, Grandma, you cough one time. I mean, in 30 seconds, boy, she done pit her pride across that floor, rubbing stuff all over your chest. <laughs> you know it'll help you go to sleep, too? I found that size a little boy one time. If you rub it a little bit right under each eye, you'll close them eyes and eventually you go to sleep. <laughs> you won't lay there staring around very long. But this ointment. The eye salve will help us observe the will of the Father. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The eye salve will give us the eyes of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. We might discern right from wrong, good from evil, I should say. What we ought to do, what we ought not do. The eye salve let us see the need of the world as the Son of God saw it. In Matthew 9, 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. I like it. I think it's in Mark, I believe. And there's a passage where he saw the men clear, saw the men as trees but after his eyes were open, he saw each man clearly. 
and shame on me for not putting that in here, but I just never really thought about that, is sometimes we're not careful. We'll just see lost people as just, just lost people, oh, wicked, oh, so, so, well, they deserve what they got anyway. Look at them, just the way they live in their life, the way they, they got this about them, they got this about them, or this mark, whatever we might associate with the sin, and we just generalize them and throw them in the garbage can. But boy, if we put that I salve with the Holy Ghost of God, the word, what is the I salve? Well, I believe it's got to do with being in the Word. Smear a little salve on us. I believe it's got to do with being yielded to the Holy Ghost of God, being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, according to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, yielded entirely to the Lord every day of our lives. Well, that's a good place to start for help with our vision in being yielded to the Lord. Be not conformed to this world, but by, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You read this word, it's going to renew your mind. You're going to think differently. Well, you read it and believe it. But hopefully if you read it, you believe it. Being yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. But the I said, back to that point, I said, will help us see the need of the world as the Son of God saw it, and we see people and just kind of cast them aside and, and call them outcasts rather than seeing every single person, no matter what their origin of life is, what their nationality, their ethnic background, their pet sin, no matter what it might be, that we'd see every one of them as a soul that Jesus Christ died for. And realize that, that man, we're unworthy. The day we get where we think we're worthy of salvation or one of the blessings of God, that's when we got a problem. That's when we're stepping into that blindness. Because that's a, that's a step into pride, and pride is very blinding. But as long as we stay humble before the Lord, realizing we're nothing but sinners saved by grace. As Paul says, by the grace of God, he is what he is. In other words, every time we see the most down and out sinner, whatever category we might put them in, don't ever think that outside of the grace of God, you could be just like that. And I'm not talking about in the spiritual realm of eternal salvation. I'm not talking about that. But sometimes in a lot of ways, we, us and our lax days, attitudes towards Christ could could care less and just, uh, boy, we'll, we'll serve God a little bit. We'll do a little. We go all over the world, chase every other aspect of life down with every bit of our being. Well, since they're playing, aren't they playing the championship game no more? While that's the case, let me hit that right now. Boy, the big Christians, man, they'll paint their bodies red. They'll put a big old G on their chest. They'll do, uh, man, they'll hoop and holler at the ball game. They'll have, man, I, and I say this, back in 1984, I had a four-wheel drive red pickup truck that was lifted up in the air and all and had a big old silver stripe down the side that said, go dogs. But I'm just saying, we'll do every, go to every extent, man. We'll, we'll worship a, a sport or an athlete, an actor, or a TV show. We'll worship all that. Man, we won't miss nothing to make sure we watch whatever show. We're going to be there on that thing. Of course, I know that don't really apply anymore because we can DVR it and all that kind of stuff. I don't even know if they even have DVRs anymore. DC, well, VCRs, sure, surely not that work. But I'm saying technology is there so we can watch when we want to. But I'm just saying we'll go to every extent to do everything, make sure little Johnny's at this, little Susie's at that, and run them all over the world, do everything, and then neglect the house of God. And it started about two or three generations ago, and I look at the church now. Look at all that blue out there. Ain't that a shame? Because somebody taught the children it was more important to do this and that than it was to be at the house of God. And I know that's just a little bit of it. There's a lot of other reasons for it. I understand that. But it all has to do with lackadaisical well, attitude, thinking more me about me and myself, and I'm okay. I don't need this. I'm good. But yet being blind, that I need to be in that pew every time them doors open. I need to hear what the Sunday school teacher's teaching on. I need to hear what the preacher's preaching on. Hey, I need to join in a collective in worship and singing those songs for the glory of God. I need to be there. I need to be there. I need to have my children there. I, you know, I'm going to tell you something. If you don't make it important, your children, forget seeing your grandchildren go to the house of God. Because that's a generational step that loses a great percent every generation. Okay, I'm off my hobby horse of that right now. The ointment. 
to observe the will of the Father, see the need of the world as God see it. As long as a person cannot see the rut they're in, they'll never need to see the, never see the need to get out of it. Just trudge along in that old rut. Just stay there, not steered by the will of God, not steered by the word of God, by the movement of God in your life. Just two blanks of clay and you just stay in a, in a rut. Bouncing off the sides of that rut of self. I just ask you this morning, I know this is kind of a generalized message in the thought of an appointment with an optician and the, the, using that as an illustration and a type maybe of getting your eyesight fixed. But I'd ask you this, sister, if you'd come forward with a song, Brother Brian, if y'all come forward with an invitation song this morning. I'd ask you this. First of all, the focus of the message this morning has been to the saved. You're here today. Would you be honest with yourself today? Say, preacher, I ain't where I ought to be. I'm not serving like I ought to be. I'm in a rut. I've got comfort in this rut. But I know it ain't where I ought to be. And I want to do more for Jesus. I want to walk closer with him this year. Would you be honest with yourself and slip out that altar? Maybe get on your knees before God and say, God help me, forgive me for not this or not that or this or that, whatever, that's between you and the Lord. But God help me to be what I ought to be. I don't know what might be troubling you this morning. Saved person, what do you need to bring to the altar this morning? Maybe you're here today and say, preacher, I've never been saved. I've never came to a place of repentance putting my faith and trust and hope in Jesus Christ. Can I remind you Christ died on the cross for you and for me today? The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. We all come short of the glory of God. We're all born sinners. Then we get old enough to understand it. We all act on it. And one way or the other, we commit sin by choice. And that sin separates us from a holy and righteous God. But don't you know that God knew that before the foundation of the world had a plan, a plan to pay our sin debt. And he took on a body. We just got through celebrating Christmas time. And when God was born in the flesh, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and he walked on this earth 33 and a half years, tempted in all points, yet without sin. And he that knew no sin became my sin and your sin on the cross of Calvary. Paid my sin debt and paid yours. If you just trust him today, believe on him, ask him to forgive you, he will. Do you know Christ is your Savior? Don't leave here lost. Save person, do business with God. Seek his face. If you think everything's hunky-dory and great, you're probably not being honest with yourself. Because we all are missing the mark and all not be all not what we ought to be for him. What do you need to bring this altar? Brother Bryant, what song this morning, brother? And may this be our prayer as you allow the Lord to deal with you. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. appreciate your attention this morning. Speaking of revive us again, I, I didn't mention, I meant to put a flyer up before I left, uh, but at Calvary Baptist Church in Gray, Georgia, on Upper River Road, where Brother Danny Monday's pastor, Brother Brian McBride's having a revival or winter revival this week. Uh, they've already 
I mean, it started today and then the service about 1.30 this afternoon, so you missed that. But uh, anyway, it'll be 7 o'clock tomorrow night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I was trying to get him to come in and preach for us tonight, but he wasn't able to. He's got a polyp on his uh, vocal cords. He sings and he sings and preaches as well, but he's, uh, he's not even singing this week up there because of that. He's trying to take care of his vocal cords until he gets surgery and take care of it and all, but he's preaching. We'll be preaching a tremendous Bible preacher. If you've never, if you never heard Brother Brian McBride, wow, what a preacher. I mean, he's just a Bible expositor and full of life at the same time. And uh, but very unique preacher. But if you'd, uh, if you'd like to go up there uh, one night this week, seven o'clock, they'd love to have you. And I'll be anyway. Let's be dismissed in word of prayer. I appreciate our visitors being here. It's good to have y'all with us today. Hope y'all come back again. Hope you've been helped today in the house of God, all of us. And uh, <coughs> what's 20, 23? Don't even seem, seem real, what does it? But uh, anyway, I'll see you back tonight, at six o'clock. I hope y'all have a Good afternoon. Brother Bryant, how about this message of word of prayer, please? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together this morning. We thank you for just your love for us and how much uh, we know you love us because you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, just thank you for the re- Brother Jim and the message you gave him this morning as we have heard from your word in Revelation 3 that uh, you want us to be excited and, and on fire for doing the things of God. And Lord, I pray that our attitude our um, would not be um, just complacent, but that it would be uh, catching to those around us, that our family and our friends and our co-workers and those in our community would know that we love you and know that we serve the true risen Savior. And Lord, may we go out from this place uh, being a testimony for you and sharing our faith and sharing the gospel with those around us. Well, we just ask that you dismiss us with your blessing and just bring us back again tonight. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.